Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 363 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I am really, really excited that you are here today as I am talking to the one, the only Carolyn Kepnes. So that's exciting. Stick around for that. Um, you may know her as the author of You. So I was really excited to talk to her. As I have said, that is coming up. Stick around. What has been going on around here? It's just a bunch of a bunch of living, a bunch of doing, a bunch of uh, being grateful for being able to live this life, to do this thing. I have been very much enjoying exploring writing about writing a little bit. I've been playing in my daily 500 words with writing about writing. And um, it's been nice and it's been feeling very kind to myself to do this exploration of what I think about writing. Cause I think a lot about writing. It's basically all I think about. So to write about it is very meta and fun. And also I'm not attaching any worth or value to the 500 words that I do. It just is, it's just what I do in the morning. First thing when I wake up. So that has been good. Um, I am about to start work on the next Patreon essay, which I think is going to be about the existential crisis of, uh, reaching all the goals of moving to New Zealand, buying a house, getting a dog. What do we do now? I don't know. So I'm going to write about it because I don't understand things until I write about them. That is how I make sense of the world. So that's what I'm going to be doing um, later this week as we get towards the end of the month. And something that I wanted to share, actually, I'll share that with you in a moment. There's an email that I want to share with you that is really, really lovely. But I will also tell you um, that... I'm so excited that people are not only buying the how to publish in today's market class that I put out last week. Um, I also did something that I want to tell you about. I, it's a big class. It's everything I know about self-publishing and traditional publishing, which is a freaking lot. I will say that. And I priced it at the price point, which those kind of classes go for. Um, I priced it at $3.99. I think that's a great deal. And it made me so uncomfortable. It made me so uncomfortable, not with a whole, not with this, like, um, you're not worthy, Rachel, this class isn't worthy. I know the class is worthy, but I also felt like that was too expensive for the people who might need it or want it. So I, it is currently 50% off. Uh, if you go to rachelheron.com slash publish, it will take you right to the class. So it's um, 197 right now, which I know is a deal. And I'm not even trying to say this to get you to buy it, although it would be great if you did. It is to say that I made a decision that people who are doing this to make a bunch of money and to um, might, might argue against like, don't lower the price of things. Here's the thing. I don't lower the price of things. I don't lower the price of my 90 days to done courses. And if anything, those are going to go up in the future. I know my worth. I know the worth of this class. And I also want more people to have it. So if you're interested in it, go to rachelirencom slash publish and grab it now. Um, I don't know what the eventual price will be. It probably will end up at $3.99 eventually after I give all you all a chance to get it. But it made me feel right. This is why I'm saying it, it made me feel right in my soul to drop the price for now for the sale. It made me feel better and more comfortable. And um, people are saying that they really like it and that they appreciate it. Y'all, I even went in and I refunded people who had bought it at the full price. I dropped it down so they only paid 197 as well. And that just felt right internally, integrity-wise. So, so there's that. That made me feel good, even though it's against advice. I like to take money for my writing. I know my own worth. I like to take money for teaching. Um, but this one, th that's what that's what I did. Okay, and this is also important. If you identify as BIPOC, LGBTQIA, disabled or unhoused, I have scholarship assistance. You can request a full or a partial scholarship. Just go to rachelheron.com slash scholarship to apply. Please do that um, if that is something that interests you. 
Okay. Now I want to read this email. I went in to see uh, new Patreon pledges and I realized that Emily Judds had, um, Emily Judds Winograd had pledged and then she had immediately upped her pledge. And I'd already asked her without noticing that, without saying that I'd already, she'd sent me an email and I'd already just responded to her this morning saying, oh, can I read this email on air? Cause I really, really like it. And then when I went to look at the Patreon pledge, I realized this is the same person. So Emily, first of all, thank you for being a patron. It really means so much to me. And I didn't know that when I asked if I could read your email on the air, which you kindly said, yes, I could and share your name. Um, and I have a special particular wish for you after this, but this is in response. So Emily signed up for my email writers list. And in that email writers list, um, it's got an auto automated responder sequence and Eventually in the sequence, you get this email that I send out that is called how to fail at writing and live to write about it. And it's in it. I share a Patreon essay about failure and what I think about failure and how I feel about failure. And she responded to that. And this is what she said. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. All caps for this. I recently discovered your podcast and your writing, and you've changed the whole game for me. Not an exaggeration. That line up there about not writing the line up there in the email that I had sent out, the line about not writing so I could hold on to the fantasy that I'd be successful once I eventually did write. That was 900% me until about a year ago when I finally got my shit together and decided to just go for it and revise my damn book, which I did. I still struggle with that feeling though, and it's been rearing its ugly head again as I make my way through query rejections for book number one and pounding out the shitty first draft of book number two, but I am pressing on. This essay reminded me that it's okay, even beneficial, question mark, to fail at my writing was exactly what I needed to read. Thanks for being a cheerleader to so many of us. You are so welcome, Emily, and you're so cool. You're so cool. And so awesome for having that revelation that so many, it takes so many of us so long to learn that as long as we hold on to the fantasy that eventually we're going to be good enough at writing to be successful at it, letting go of that, letting go of the not writing in order to write crap and then to edit that crap into slightly less crap is how writers are made. That is the moment in which a writer is truly forged. I think when they have that deep internal revelation, that knowledge that, oh, I'm never going to do it unless I just do it badly. And I can't make anyone have that revelation, but I can sure cheer you on when you have it. And I'm so glad that you had that revelation about a year ago and that you did revise your book and query rejections on your book absolutely don't matter. They are the rule. The exception are the query requests for partials or for fulls or for getting an agent. Those are the exceptions. And we do the work anyway. We do the work until we reach what we want, whether that is getting an agent or self-publishing or doing whatever it is. But until then, we just keep failing. We keep getting rejections. Like I have told you about this book that recently sold. Um, the vast majority of editors we sent it to rejected it. And then it was sold. It only takes one, et cetera. Um, every, uh, you, all, you all know that one. It just takes the one to see it. But that is hard to remember when the rejections are flowing in. The rejections are not about you. They're not about your book. They're about the timing that the agent got this book. You're doing incredible. You're doing awesome. And I am so proud of you. And thank you for sending me this letter because it reminded me again, that we have to fail regularly and often in order to move forward in this life. And there's nothing wrong with that. And yes, it is. How did you say it? Um, even beneficial question mark. So for you, Emily, I wish for you to fail with grace and beauty as often as it takes for the success to always catch you. That is my wish for you. And thank you for sending me this email. It really made my day. And I'm just tickled that you're also the um, patron that I was going to thank today. So thank you. Okay, let's jump into the interview with Carolyn. Carolyn Kepnes is the author of You, Hidden Bodies, Providence, 
You Love Me, and numerous short stories. Her work has been translated into a multitude of languages and inspired a television series adaptation of You, currently on Netflix. Kepnes graduated from Brown University and previously worked as a pop culture journalist for Entertainment Weekly and a TV writer for Seventh Heaven and The Secret Life of the American Teenager. She grew up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and now lives in Los Angeles. Her most recent release is For You and Only You. Please enjoy this interview. Please keep writing, keep failing, and keep getting up again, doing a little bit more, because that is how we move through this life. Thank you for being here, everybody. Please enjoy and happy writing to you. Well, my God, I'm excited to have you on the show today. Hello. Will you please share your name and your pronouns with us? I am Caroline Kepnes, and it is she, her. Caroline, I am just thrilled to have you on the show. I am a fangirl, and I'm sure you hear that all the time. Um, but I will say, I was reading you before, blew up into the television series. So I'm like one of the before girlies. Oh, I, yes. I, you, you guys know? are special, wonderful group. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I so. love that feeling when you were there in the beginning and then something was- else. Yeah, it's a good feeling. I loved that band first. Yes, exactly. So, yes. but I've, I've got to ask you questions about your process because you are remarkably prol- prolific. You write in the You series and the newest book for you and only you is coming out. It will be out by the time the show is live. Um, so that's super exciting, but you also write standalones. And I, I don't know if people ask you this, but I'm fascinated because uh, I have written series and I, and and then I get real sick of series sometimes. How do you feel? How do you balance the sick the of plus food, the- right? Uh, was like that-, that series and having those moments of like, oh my God, when you when it hits you like the amount of time, the hours, the years, the 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 way that this they're not real. I'm like I when I think it's ten person and I it's yes. Yes. Yeah. So what do you prefer? Do you prefer series or do you prefer standalones in your heart of hearts? What I love about writing is that I love when I'm, whatever I'm in, I genuinely do feel that way that like whatever I'm working on, once I have get those moods, which to me, there's a different mood for standalone. Yeah. Because I've only had one standalone published. I've just had this very extreme experience of like, this is almost all I know. So I couldn't keep doing it if I didn't love it, but I'm excited to have another standalone eventually. Oh, that is so cool. I actually have that one. What is it called? It begins with a P Providence. Providence, Um, I have it on my Kindle. It's waiting for me. I'm going away this weekend on a writing retreat and I'm going to be reading it. So that's going to be great. Nice. Um, Tell me about your writing process when and where, and how do you get it all done? It's like up late. I don't know. Over the past couple of years, I've become a morning person which I never was. And now I wake up and my, I like that pre copy writing. Like that's my, I keep the computer nearby. And sometimes it's like, I wake up and I have things to say or whatever I was frustrated with yesterday. The answer is in my head. And the, what I, now I understand those smug morning people because there's nothing like, like when it's 10 30 and you're like, Oh my God, like <laughs> only 10 30. And I spent most of my life as the person who was getting up at 10 30. So I feel like a traitor to my true self, but it's just, I think it's getting older. I don't know what it is. And maybe pandemic of all of that time of like no nightlife, maybe that had something, some kind of a reset that, but even now when I go out and stuff, I just wake up early. So I, I like to, I do like that feeling. And then I like that you got something Thing done and then I'll do other things like sometimes responsible things often irresponsible and I like when it kind of scratches at you the morning work yes. and you kind of know how to fix it and then to me every writing day that's the decision of like around 4 30 I'm like okay I could I feel like I know everything that's wrong and I know how to fix it I could go in and do that now or I could wait and see if the answers seem right in the morning and sometimes I do it then. And so, you know, but it's like, it, it's, I feel like it's nonstop negotiation with your time, right? Like, so where do you game with yourself? Yes. I'm fascinated because I don't hear many people who talk about changing their chronotype when it comes to actually doing the writing, but that makes total sense. Um, and so where do you fall on the planner pantser spectrum? So I feel like I love both on a daily basis, like in an overall place, like, I I get to, I like to get really close and really obsessive. And then I feel like, and in that creative place, like when you think about writing as in theory and it's like, la, 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 la. And then when I feel that energy go into like 
the back of my head is like, wait a minute, three pages ago, this doesn't make sense. Why are you doing that? That's what I'm like, okay, now I need to do a little plotting. And sometimes that means writing it down. Sometimes that means thinking, but it's like when that inner critic, and it sounds like fucking Joe, you know, <laughs> I guess that's what, with these books with this long, especially when you're, when he's so critical of so much, do you know what I mean? And then with that's this book, funny. especially it's like, it's a book about books yeah. and this guy who just thinks he's, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So navigating that is like, I like, I like the pantsing. I'm like, who would write without some pantsing, right? When it just surprises you and you think you know something, but like you're in flow and it's like, oh my God. It's but the eventually. best feeling. That is my favorite feeling is when it shocks the hell out of me. And I'm also usually like, oh no, this ruins yes. everything. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And then it's, yes. And then you, you know, like, oh, I've just made so much more work for myself. But if I don't, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's really awesome. like a tragic process of like, I don't ski, but I feel like you take this chairlift up there to get down in like 20, 20 you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> That's a really good way to say it. I love that. Okay. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? My biggest challenge when it comes to writing is that I write so long. Like mm. I, I, it's, I know that I'll always be that way. Like no matter every book, I'm like, this is going to be the one that's 300 pages. I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, and I, it is something I want to fix. And I hope that they read fast. And that's what people say. They absolutely they do. Read fast. Yes. But that's my problem that like, I, I just take a long time. And I let at the same time, I, I think about like, when I try to break things up, I'm like, oh, but it's this, that, that I want it all there. So yeah, I have a hard time, like saying goodbye to a big chunk of something too. Like in every... Yeah book there's this element that I'm like if I would just cut that then I'm like no <laughs> so do you feel like I, I feel like most writers know if they're an overwriter or an underwriter really naturally it sounds like you are just an overwriter just like myself yes yeah but then one of my hiccups is that in the parts where like it should say I think that this is pretty common for us right like you overwrite overwrite and then something major happens that your character is like a major moment and I'm like and then they all went and had dinner and it's like wait what what like, can you add a couple of sentences here? Like, can you like, like I avoid almost like being avoidant of conflict. Yes. Like I just avoid what I'm like, oh, it's so much trouble. So I'll just say in as few words. And, and that's, yeah. and that's why editors are amazing. Cause they will, exactly. they will tell us about it. What is your <laughs> biggest joy when it comes to writing? The joy is the surprise that to me, the joy is being lost in it and the light is changing outside and I'm like, oh my God, three hours have passed. Like I, it's like old school lame, but to me, that is the joy. Like that is just, and it's the same way with reading a book. Anytime that you're lifted as if you're on drugs out of yeah. your headspace and out of the consciousness, it's my obsession with reading and writing that I'm like everything else that we love, you can multitask, but you just fucking can't with reading and writing, right? Yes. Like if you're reading exactly. a book, whether it's in your phone or your hand, like turning the pages, it's your brain has to do all that work. And if you're writing, you, it's the same kind of thing. And yeah, that like, is... these are the things like, I feel like as a, as a overly anxious, like fast, busy thinking, not necessarily accomplishing, but just like do a person, those things are like, ah, <laughs> yes. I love that so much. Yes. I, um, I'm ADHD and also sober. And I feel like my what? last remaining crutch is the reading and the writing. That is where I can truly lose myself. And I think it was really my first vice as well, too. That was the first yes. place I ever lost myself, but five and six years old. That's, and I, I'll never, you'll, you'll yeah, never take and, it from and me. You're, I, I love reading at that age. And you're like, it's like you've cracked a code and you know how to live somewhere else and yeah. to keep the lights on and sneak and all of that. Yes. It's so gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Can you share a craft tip of any sort Start with us? It. Yes. I mean, I, it's, kind of common, but I rewriting, I just really believe in rewriting. I also believe like one of my favorite things is when I've rewritten something so many times, and then I kind of walk away and I'm like, what if there was a blank page? Like, I feel like we're taught to fear the blank page, but the blank page page can be the best friend you ever had. Happened to me when I was young that I lost something, like my computer died and I was so upset. And then, you know, in your twenties, everything that happens is like up here. Like you'd think that I had war and peace on there, you know? Oh, oh, did it go out? Oh, uh, no, I can hear you just fine. And I remember like a, an older friend saying, well, why don't you just write it again? And I was like, because I did it. It was there. Like, and she was like, you'll know if what you did by trying to do it verbatim. 
And it ended up being a story that I love that would like had the bones of the thing I'd written before, but it was a good lesson of like, you know, sometimes if you're, if you're tired of looking at something, don't look at it, go into a new document, like even try and kind of transcribe what's there and you wind up having a new take on it, a new perspective, whatever was bothering you. Because sometimes when you're in a line edit mentality, you could, it's like with an outfit, you know what I mean? <laughs> like sometimes you just got to take it all off and go back in your closet. <laughs> I think that is so, so, so smart. What if the page was blank? Because when you are in that line edit mode, I find myself super precious, especially yes. when I'm confused. Like I can't cut this line because it's a good line. And I can't cut that paragraph because I need it later for this. But if you start from the top, I, I can confess to you that the, <laughs> the solution has perhaps never crossed my mind. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of blow, yeah. blowing me away. Yeah, because it's like, I feel like there's such a like thing in our world about the blank page and it's intimidating and like, oh my God. And once you've conquered it, but it's like, it's also your little friend Thank and it is where everything starts. That. Yeah. Thank you. That is truly, Good. I'm going to carry that away with me today. Oh, yay. What, that let me ask you, what is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you in your writing career? I feel like before I was even published, Colleen Hoover got her hands on my book. I did not know her personally. She had this, you know, enormous following and suddenly people were reading it and talking ah. about it. And it was like the nicest gift. And I remember being like, just in awe that like, she loved it, connected to it. She was funny and like, you know, the sixth sense of humor about it. And it just, it was a really like nice way to go into being published to having this community of readers. I feel like I will always credit with her and Taryn Fisher also, they were just like, you know, all over it. Just because they love the book. That's, that's yeah, why they did it. Was it was so pure, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. What is the kindest thing you've ever done for yourself as a writer? I, that one, when I, like, I've been thinking about this question and I'm like, I feel like it has to do with hotels and it's not that often. And it seems like such a princess answer, but over the years, I'm like, when I've done that, like it really like, like with you, with my last book, you love me. I went to Bainbridge, like after I wrote mm. the book, after I had that draft. And with this book, like it was the same thing. I went and stayed in near Harvard for a little bit after I had the draft. I feel like that's the treat. Like if I go somewhere and try and make it up while I'm in it, it's almost like being on vacation and trying to like bring everyone with you and the brain is all over the place. But I love when you have that draft and you're kind of, you know, it's not the book, but it's enough that like, you know, at least eventually a book. And then you get to treat yourself to the sensory input that like, and if there's something about being like in a different space, in a place that's like, I love hotel rooms. I'm just, I yeah. I am literally leaving tomorrow to go on a, a solo writer retreat, which I try to do every three to four months. And, um, and I never work when I'm on them. I just, I just read and I journal. Yep. If I were to have to write and meet a deadline, I would hate every minute of it, but I've got a hot tub and an ocean view and like your book and 12 others on my Kindle yes. ready to go. I think it's something that's getting lost too, like that everything, all the technology we have kind of teaches us the opposite. And it's like, you're supposed to have those periods where you're not outputting a lot. And, you know, this is, and then whatever you can do to make them is like good for you. And probably yes. also good as a human. Yeah. It's good as do a you human. bring your computer. I don't even bring my computer. You don't. Oh my God. Oh, you're like, yeah, you're. But like, I usually like, wow. choose a place that is intentionally cut off, like no Wi Fi, coast of New Zealand, like no, no cell. I am going oh, to be yeah. totally cut off. So why bring the computer? I did bring the computer a couple of times and I was, and it never came out of my bag. Yep. So I tell everybody that I am unreachable. My wife knows how to get hold of me. I mean, That's usually amazing. she does. I should like, probably I tell like, her. How long do you go for? I, you know what? I have worked it out that for me, three nights is perfect. Wait, no, so sorry. Four nights is perfect because four, you okay. need to get full three full days, like one day to chill out. And then one day to like really think some deep thoughts. And then another day to chill out and just read. And Four nights. Okay, this is the best advice. Like that, that <laughs> sounds like I like how when the math is sorted like that, the emotional math and the like healing math. Yes, because <laughs> three three nights was always too short, and five nights I I, I I'm dying to get home. That can but, go to the shining crazy place. E yeah, exactly. When you're that when you're that cut off, but four nights is just I cannot wait. I cannot wait. So thank you for saying that. That is I I love yeah. that. That is a kind thing that you do for yourself. Um, that's beautiful. What is the best book that you read recently? Why did you love it? I like, I have a couple. I am so yeah. excited. I loved the book Red Widow so much by Alma Katsu. Mm -hmm. And I have Red London, which I'm like, try, I want to just devour it, but I'm going slowly. I love her writing. She's one of those amazing people who can write like about such different things. And hers, you can always tell it's her, like her voice. But I'm like, how do you know this much about the world? <laughs> like, 
because it's one of my things when I write books about this guy who, let's face it, he's not a spy. He doesn't do anything. I love books where it's like, someone's like doing something, which means the writer learned about how to do this. Like, yeah. Yeah. I haven't read her. So many great books awesome. about like writing in the ether lately, like uh, uh, Julia Bart's The Writer's Retreat, or is it Writing Retreat? I'm probably getting that Ooh, wrong. I don't know. Like, yeah, that's a good book. Mind fuck little yes, really okay. Yes. That's um, I'm that that might come with me too on my writer's retreat. That would be a little bit meta, fabulous. Yes. Thank you so much. Sure. Will you please tell us about the most recent Joe book and all of that? Oh, yes, like I feel like this is the thing I am the worst at that I always yeah. have been <laughs> to the point where friends have been like, it's almost like I, I'm a party trick where they're like, tell someone about your book, and whatever I say is like friends are like, what? Like, what is wrong with you? Like, that's how you describe it. Like, like even I was in a, a taxi once and the guy, you know, we're like small talk and just, you know, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I write these books. And he's like, oh, what are they about? I'm like, oh, they're about a guy that works in a bookstore. And he is very like, he has a sensitive soul and he falls in love easily. And he's very passionate. He's like, you mean the murder, the bookstore guy that kills people? I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like it's like, really, ooh. it's romantic. It's Joe. <laughs> yeah. yes. So in this one, I wanted to take Joe to Harvard university because he spent his pandemic writing a book and figuring out how to get himself a slot in a very coveted, amazing little new fellowship of writers. And what would be more difficult for Joe than being on equal terms with people who is used to thinking of who, who look down on him. And that to me is the energy of the book. Like this is the like ultimate, be careful what you wish for, for Joe, because he's, there's comfort in always getting the short end of the stick. There's yeah. comfort in always feeling like, oh, it's not fair. And I didn't have what they have. And when you get what they have, like now he's sitting in a room with these people and shock of shocks, he meets a girl, <laughs> like the only other person who's like him didn't go to college and he gets along with her and all the other writers in the fellowship, not so much. <laughs> Uh, because she's like, my eyes are just like sparkling. I cannot wait to read this one. So, oh my gosh, where can we find you online? I am, I'm on Twitter. I feel like I am the most uninteresting person. I am like the, the retweet, you know, like retweet, like yeah, once in a while I say something always awkwardly worded because I feel like <laughs> it's like a lot of those things. If you exercise that muscle, like the people that I know that are good at it, some of them, it comes naturally them. Some of them you can see like, oh, it's like anything. If you lift the weights, you're lifting more weight and getting stronger. I go on there. I'm like, whatever I say, like, I feel like I can say happy birthday and it comes out wrong. And twisted. <laughs> I like Instagram, but I, yeah, I, I feel like also writing these books for 10 years. I think that's why I'm a little guarded on all of them and where I am mm. a little stilted because I've just spent so much of the past 10 years writing about someone who just tears them, uses them to kill people. Like, <laughs> You yeah. are so utterly delightful. What oh, a you. treat to get to talk to you. Thank you, Caroline, for being here so much. I can't, can't tell you what, a, how much fun this was. I keep writing books so I can come back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And happy writing to you. Thank you.